Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. Read a newspaper, turn on the radio or the television, pull up news websites and internet bulletin boards. It is everywhere. War. Rumors of war. Threats of war. Consequences of war. Protests of war. Counter-protests in favor of war. We are saturated with information about war. We have noted that in spite of this saturated coverage, little information is offered about the Anglo-US-Iraqi war other than bombings, casualties, and profiles of G.I. Joe. Oh, and there have been some protests around the world and crowds are large. What the crowds are saying, how they critique the war, and what they want, isn't important to the corporate media. Just the ever-disputed count of their numbers is newsworthy, it appears. U.S. General William Westmoreland spoke of the news coverage on the Vietnam War. Quote, Vietnam was the first war ever fought without any censorship. Without censorship, things can get terribly confused in the public mind. Close quote. Vietnam was the first televised war. The first Gulf War generals took Westmoreland's words to heart and made sure that the press had little coverage, allowing only well-controlled press conferences. The U.S. government took some criticism for this closed-mouth policy. The U.S. press took even more criticism for allowing this to control their coverage. During this Gulf War, a compromise has been reached, and now the U.S. military and its press corps are fully in bed with each other. We now have a thing called the, quote, embedded journalist, close quote. Each military ground commander has decided how many journalists he or she can accommodate and protect as they proceed in their campaign. These embedded journalists travel with the troops and are given limited access to the action, emphasizing the fighting soldier. On the surface, this seems like a compromise between battle conditions and freedom of the press, but whether intended or not, this kind of coverage has the effect of unmarking the military and political hierarchy that controls the battle. Protesters in the U.S. are being criticized by the government and pro-war activists for showing a lack of support for American troops. This kind of embedded coverage of the war works well with that anti-protest rhetoric. We see the war from the eyes of those troops, and we sympathize, forgetting who put these troops in harm's way and why they are there in the first place. More extensive coverage of anti-war efforts has been left to the activists themselves. Only independent sources carry extensive discussions about activism in the United States. Canada and European presses have been more balanced in their coverage, but they still often concentrate on quantity rather than quality. This discussion of who and how many leaves the messages of the protesters on the back burner. The global anti-war protests have a much more complex relationship to war, the specific conflict, and the related issues surrounding this war. We spoke with U.S. sociologist and peace activist Kathy Felty this week about her work protesting the war on Iraq. She is an associate professor of sociology at the University of Akron. Her research areas are homelessness and violence in the lives of women and girls, citizen participation in local communities, and spirituality and social change. She is co-founder of the Campus Community Against War at the University of Akron. She is also active in People for Peace of Greater Akron, a community coalition formed after 9-11. Kathy spoke with us, reflecting upon why she feels her anti-war stance is important and on the social interaction aspects of working for peace in a country at war. These issues are important. Consider the words of Hermann Goering, Commander-in-Chief of the Luftwaffe, President of the Reichstag, Prime Minister of Prussia, and, as Hitler's designated successor, the number two man in the Third Reich. Quote, Naturally, the common people don't want war. But after all, it is the leaders of a country who determine the policy, and it is always a simple matter to drag the people along, whether it is a democracy, or a fascist dictatorship, or a parliament, or a communist dictatorship. Voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. That is easy. 
All you have to do is to tell them they are being attacked and denounce the pacifists for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same in every country, close quote. Join us this hour as we examine the protest movement a little more closely and air our grievances with the press that refuses to cover them in an episode called The Made-for-TV War. I wanted to start by kind of talking about the role of peace activist and why it seems to coincide so often with college student or with academics, um, intellectuals, so forth. Do you see this? Well, first of all, do you agree with this assessment? Because this might be more of a stereotype than truth. And also, do you think that there are reasons why more intellectual people tend to be questioning of things like war. Well, kind of a twofold response to that, um, and I guess the first fold is that it's since I'm located in academia, and so that's the world that I'm kind of operating in and out of. Those are the people that I'm talking to and reacting with, and all of that. So. I, I guess I'm not in a position to say, no, I think that's a, an overstatement, because from where I am, it looks like that's very much the case, that it's people who are in higher education, in academia, kind of doing intellectual work, um, doing research, teaching, that are on the forefront of really a lot of social movements, a lot of um, kind of forward thinking about social change. And I think that it's because it's it's really a natural outgrowth of what we do. If you're involved in research um, and teaching, you spend your time critically thinking about the world in which we live, no matter what your discipline is. Um, you, you know, you're involved in critical thinking. Certainly in sociology, that's true. Um, and we're thinking about, you know, human groups and um, how we create a society. And so we're approaching that and kind of taking it apart, putting it back together, thinking about power, issues of power and inequality and social justice. And so when that's your subject matter, I think it's a natural outgrowth that you would maybe see things um, a little bit differently, um, not so readily accept mainstream discourse about about any given social situation. Um, so certainly with something like the war that we find ourselves in, the mainstream media is presenting things in a particular kind of way, using a particular kind of rhetoric. And I think for a lot of people, if that's their source of information and they're not practicing critical thinking skills, I certainly think everybody's capable <laughs> of criti being a critical thinker. But if you're not practicing that on an everyday basis, if it's not part of what you're doing with your life, that might be the most accessible way to learn about what's going on in the world. And so that's how you start making sense of the world. But for those of us that are using different avenues, and it's our job to kind of get at the story um, of, in sociology, get at the story of human experience um, and human experience in groups, then we're delving beneath that surface all the time. And so I really think it's, an, you know, it's kind of an outgrowth of doing that, being used to thinking in that way. I remember telling someone years ago, um, you know, when, when you become a sociologist and you do that full time, you're not all that much fun to go to the movies with. So I remember one time driving down the freeway and seeing a woman hanging her laundry out, and it was a beautiful day and the wind was blowing, and I just had this moment of, I wish I could just be there, you know, yeah. just not kind of not having the information, not having the perspective, not having the analysis. Um, just be hanging the sheets on the line. It was just that moment of longing for to have blinders back on. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's very painful to know. Do you think that governments get away with doing war in spite of the questioning of it 
because there are a number of people who would just rather be hanging laundry out and don't want to think about it? My read is from my students that there are students that have an emotional reaction, a very uncomfortable emotional reaction to something like the war, but they don't have a framework for thinking about that. For one thing, they seem to be fairly devoid of history, that they don't have a sense of the history of of war, um, the history of social movement activity about war. I mean, my students were shocked to find out that there were protesters during the world wars. Um, Their understanding of those wars is that everybody was happy and get to grow their victory garden and um, be part of the cause. They were astounded to find out it was for World War II in particular, that it was a fairly sizable protest. So I think not having a historical context, not having a framework for thinking about things differently, it makes it difficult to give expression to a different point of view. You know, it's kind of that whole, until there's a language to talk about something with, it's a little bit hard to claim that that truth or that reality. Um, So I think that's part of it. Um, I think the other part is um, we had a uh, walkout here at the University of Akron last week, and there were counter-protesters, pro-war protesters. And what I saw in their behavior was this real adrenaline high um, fueled by the sense of rightness um, and power. And, And, you know, we're the good guys in the world and Whatever it is that we decide to do, it's the right course of action, and, and, and that's disturbing to me. Actually, that's more disturbing to me than the people who are rating that of ignorance. You know, and I, yeah. by ignorance, I mean not knowing our past, not knowing um, kind so of the story. The ones who feel uncomfortable but don't have the language for it, Right. that's one thing. But those who find a language that is good guy, bad guy, I'm right, you're wrong, Right. those are the scarier ones. Absolutely. I think that one of the things that an intellectual does is deals with ambiguity, deals with the gray areas. Mm -hmm. And when you begin to get into critical thinking, when you begin to see the world with a critical eye, so to speak, one of the things that that mucks it up and makes it more uncomfortable is that you do live in a world where things are not absolutely right and absolutely wrong anymore. Right. And so you scratch your head and go, well, wait a minute, on the other hand, you know, those kind of things. And I think that it is difficult for some people, whether by training or by personality or whatever reasoning you want to give for it, to live with that kind of ambiguity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that's true. And in sociology, of course, we're at the very, from the very get-go in our intro classes, we're teaching Verstein, you know, empathetic yes. understanding. And so what that means, if you're able to practice that, it means that you can shift from your vantage point to see the world through the experiences of what we might think of as the other. And once you can do that, it's very difficult to view anyone as enemy. So I think that it is a problematic, and I would say probably those students who are defining the world in right and wrong, good and evil, don't practice that, maybe can't practice that. I would argue that if they could practice that, it would be very difficult to frame the world in those terms. Mm -hmm. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio. 101.9 101.9 FM, 104.3 cable, and on the internet, cfuv.uvig.ca. Giving sociology an edge! My experience has been that the sense of rightness doesn't necessarily only show up for those who are for what the government is doing. There is a kind of righteousness that happens sometimes in the left as well. Mm -hmm. No, I think you're absolutely right. I think of that as um, a type of fundamentalism, um, Hmm. that that in a fundamental way, we have the answers and we are the righteous. And I see that as dangerous no matter 
where which direction it's coming mm-hmm. from. And it, I had an interesting experience at the um, walkout that we organized. Um, there were a number of counter protesters there, and I was one of the speakers, and they were pretty vicious. Um, and it was interesting to watch. Um, once I kind of stepped out outside of my speaking role and just watched some of the interaction that was occurring, because the um, counter protesters were really, really angry. And I was speaking very personally. I was talking about um, my own um, history, and um, I was raised in the military with a career Air Force um, officer. It was my is my father. He's now retired, um, decorated veteran of several wars, and so on. And so I was sharing that history as a way of talking about what I learned about war and some things that my father taught me that actually have guided my the development of my values. So whenever you're talking about your own story, it's horrible to be shouted down and told that you you know you should be killed for what you're saying and um, to shut up. And I mean, just you know, it's really pretty pretty vicious. And so when I finished talking, and I got through the whole thing, kind of kept it together. And when I finished talking and handed over the megaphone to someone else, I started crying. And Mm -hmm. I cried and cried. And it was really the first that I had cried about about it all. Um, I mean, you know, we've been, I've been pretty proactive really since 9-11 in talking about peace and um, organizing around peace. And but it's the first that I really just kind of let it all go. And so one of my colleagues um, who's very, very far on the left and very outspoken came over and he said, you know we're right. You, you don't have to cry. You know we're right. And I said, I'm not crying because we're not, because of right and wrong here. That's not, I am crying because this, this is breaking my heart. It is breaking my heart that these young people are so shut down. They're so afraid of what I might say that they can't even hear my story, that, that they have to silence me, that their, their energy is going into silencing. Um, don't they, you know, and, and that's where I am. It's not about being right or wrong. It's interesting, too, to watch the news coverage. And, of course, I, we do get American television in um, Canada, but we also have the benefit of coverage out that is uh, generated from here or from Europe that I don't think that Americans are seeing as often. Right. But it's been, and it's, and the coverage is very different, by the way. I don't know whether you're aware of that or not, but we've, I've been amazed at the differences between the coverage that Canada is giving and the coverage that the States is giving. But one of the things that I've picked up on in the discussions about the anti-war movement in the American channels is a sense of that who's right and who's not. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, it's black and white, good and bad. Um, I mean, even in, on the nightly news, the way that criminal behavior is talked about, it's in terms of individuals and individuals being bad guys. I mean, and this is just on an ordinary day in the news where there's this polarization of people into specific categories right exactly and so i really do see that being exacerbated here and i i see um some of the folks that i know that work in the media having a difficult time trying to capture some of those nuances that people are really struggling with how they feel and think about this war and you know there's something very significant going on that the anti-war um, movement is made up of, I mean, it's intergenerational, it's cross-class, it's cross-race, it's, um, it's really quite amazing to go to these rallies and, and see kind of the diversity of people that are, are represented there. I have an impression from independent media sources, you know, reading some stuff on the internet and that kind of thing, that these rallies are also being attended by people with diverse causes. Mm-hmm. That there is a sense that not only is there a protest against the war per se, you know, against the war as a bad thing that is happening that should end, but also an understanding of the war as something that is getting in the way of issues that need to be addressed. 
But it seems to me that there are people like, for instance, who are there from the environmental movement or who are there from the point of view of poverty or racism, those kinds of issues, who are saying, wait a minute, not only is this war unjust in the sense that it wasn't necessary to do it in order to achieve something in Iraq, but also it's unjust because it is being used to take resources away from these important issues. Is that kind of complexity also available in in these rallies? Do you know in the at the local level, I'm not seeing that as much. Um, I'm seeing a pretty focused um, anti-war, pro-peace uh, kind of drawing together of people from different groups and um, that have always groups that have always existed. You know, the Quakers, for example, mm-hmm. um, and who are now kind of you know, joining in with groups that they um, that didn't exist before all of this. So at the local level, I'm not seeing that. At the national level, um, in D.C., um, I went to the march in January, and that was very much the case, that you had a range of speakers, uh, political, um, popular, social movement folks, um, you know, organizers, talking about and across all of these kinds of issues. So uh, certainly, and and tying it back to um, a criticism, kind of this larger criticism of the current administration, Mm -hmm. that not only um, are we upset that this administration is taking us into this war, but they're also making these other kinds of decisions um, that these political issues are being um, brought together as a, to create this kind of unified criticism that this administration is um, making choices that are going to affect us as a population for a very long time to come. And it's kind of on all fronts, the economy, um, issues of race, issues of um, the environment and um, how much we're going to protect it or fail to protect it, in fact, exploit Mm it. I think all of that is true. And and so I think that's one way that that it's being brought together is as this very specific criticism of this particular administration at this particular point in history. Um, But I also think that there's a more, a way that is more sophisticated in that it doesn't necessarily have a specific um, political outcome. So it's not just a criticism of, of a current administration, but is more of a theoretical understanding of how all of these things are interconnected and that... Um, if we are building military and putting our, our resources into weapons and, um, and into military presence kind of globally, um, that that intersects with and shapes environmental policies, which intersects with and shapes and is shaped by um, race and racial inequality, um, but all, but I think all brought to the global level. Um, mm-hmm. that we can't stay kind of talking nationally about these things, um, although that's where our policies are created and played out, because it is about this kind of global reality. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM, Victoria. You're a sociologist, and you talked a little bit about your um, childhood and your relationship to your father being part of why you are taking an anti-war stance. But I'm I'm also hearing that sociology has informed this for you. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit, and I think this relates very well to the global perspective and the interconnectivity of these different issues, what, how do you think, well, for you personally and maybe for people in general, how do you think sociology adds to this knowledge that, that helps you take this anti-war stance 
and also this kind of critical thought. How does sociology help? One of the most important things that I learned from my father um, was not something that he directly taught me. It was something. It was a choice that he made that actually um, he paid a price for, and that was when he went to Vietnam. He was he, a pilot, and he was supposed to fly bomber, which he was trained to do, and he refused to fly a bomber to bomb in Vietnam because by the time that he was sent, it was 69, so it was fairly far along in the game, and we knew at that point that villages um, were being bombed and that many civilians were not only being killed as kind of a, a side effect of war, but as a, a direct strategy in this war. And it didn't coincide with his religious beliefs. Um, that is, he could be in the military and he could fight in a war and he could drop bombs in a war, but not when it was women and children who were not in the military who were involved. It had a profound effect because, oh, as I say, he paid a very high price for it. He ended up flying cargo, which is really kind of a low-status pilot thing to be doing, especially for um, a lieutenant colonel. And so he's flying in supplies. He's flying in and picking up you know, the wounded and the dead at the end of the day, um, and he's never promoted beyond lieutenant colonel as mm -hmm. a result of that choice. So that, to me, said something very important about knowing who you are in relationship to what you do and being willing to experience um, or make a personal sacrifice to be true to what you believe. So even though I'm politically very <laughs> far afield from my dad, even to this day, that was something that weighed in for me um, at a young age and then throughout. So as a sociologist, what I'm grappling with is really understanding how do people who don't have control over the resources, make choices, make decisions, and survive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what does that survival look like? So that, I guess, is my, a central question for me in the work that I do. And so it certainly shapes how I see the world in which we live, the larger world in which we live, and then um, my personal politics in terms of something like war. Where are the resources? Um, who's controlling those resources and who's benefiting from them? Um, and what? who's paying the price for the unequal distribution of those resources? And what is being used to kind of enforce that inequality? And so those are all the kinds of sociological questions that I'm kind of working my way through all of this with. Um, and, and sometimes it makes a whole lot of sense, and it comes together in a way that I think, aha, <laughs> that's, how, that's that piece, or, or <laughs> that's the issue that, that you know, we need to be thinking about. And then other times, and I think this is the power of, of ideology, at other times I can feel just as lost as the next person. Mm -hmm. One of the problems that protesting has just inherent in it because of the nature of protest is that it generally takes a stance against the other. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the anti-war movement. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering how sociology would inform any ideas that we might have to present an alternative, not just an alternative to the war, but also an alternative to international relations. Do you see sociology as a source, a resource, that might be used to come up with alternatives? And, and have you thought much, or do you, you think people in the anti-war movement think much about how they create these alternatives? I think there's some discussion sometimes about the alternatives, but I really think... Um, the people that are in the movement and who are very focused in, in what they're trying to accomplish um, are putting all of their energy and their resources there. And I, I met with a colleague, in fact, the person who co-founded um, the Campus Community Against War group that we have here at the university. I met with her today, and I said, you know, sometimes it's just really hard 
to cook dinner, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because we, we've been going to these rallies and meetings, and um, and it's very focused and it's very um, goal oriented, and it, and I really think that that is how a lot of um, movements, especially those that are kind of going up against, um, you know, the dominant systems, that's how they're operating. Um, so that idea of what's the alternative is the conversation that, you know, we have in our spare time, but it's not where we get to put a whole lot of our of our effort. I think, though, that there's a lot of promise in sociology in that way. Um, I'm a big fan, uh, fan of Elise Boulding, who for much of her career, wrote about envisioning a world without weapons. And she worked internationally and um, orchestrated conversations and workshops for people to come together and to begin the work of imagining, as she called it, imaging, claiming that if you can't visualize it, if you can't articulate it, then you can't make it real, which of course is a very sociological principle that what we define as real is very real in its consequences. And so if we can't even articulate or, or have a picture of what this world looks like, then we're, we can't move towards it. Mm -hmm. We can't bring it into being. And I think that's the promise of sociology, that you have that understanding that we create the social reality, and so if we if we create it, then there's a whole range of possibilities open. Um, you know, if we kind of shift away from our our fear, you know, I think that's in many ways fear driven, and I think that the media feeds that fear and the government feeds that fear. If we can kind of shift away from that and and have the opportunity to do some of that work of imaging a different kind of world, that that's our starting point. Well, that's cool. That sort of gives a whole another dimension to the idea of the sociological imagination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know I, who I think does this very well um, in kind of a, um, in a popularized way is um, Michael Moore, you know, and in Col Bowling for Columbine. That's what he's saying. Well, wait a minute. Like, you know, look, here's a society, you know, when he goes and looks at Canada and gun o ownership and sense of personal safety and all of those kinds of things and says, okay, well, here, here's an example. And I think that's wonderful because what it does is, because I think oftentimes we're in denial that there's any other way to be, mm -hmm. you know, when, when you're talking about being in a particular location. Um, and the U.S. is, I think, operating at a disadvantage anyways in terms of taking in other people's experiences because we're so indoctrinated into we're the best, we're the strongest, we're the, you know, superior. Um, and I think that's a really bad thing for a, to teach our children and to reify over and over in our culture. Because it, it shuts it us certainly, down. Yeah, it limits, it certainly limits what can be thought about. Right. Limits what can be talked about. Well, I hate to do this because I've really enjoyed talking to you, but uh, we really are out of time. Well, it has really been a pleasure to talk with you. I've really enjoyed this, and I enjoyed your questions. And, and it, I haven't really talked with anybody about it in this kind of way, so thank you so much. And uh, I'm sure that our audience will appreciate hearing a little bit more about the movement in ways that they don't get to hear about it often in the press. I was home this weekend watching the war on television, which is what it's for, uh, in my estimation. It's a made-for-TV war. And I thought to myself, you know, this really does not qualify me to speak intelligently about the war. All I know about it is what I've seen on television and through the popular media. And then it occurred to me that 
that was probably the best one could do anyway, to wit that the sources are being controlled in a way that makes it difficult in extremists for anyone to be better informed about the war than he could be by watching television, listening to the radio, reading the popular press. Yeah, I got to tell you, I was going down the road listening to a radio station, and it had Donald Rumsfeld, who's in U.S. Secretary of Defense, and he's complaining. Well, first of all, it was kind of humorous because he's complaining about the media coverage of the bombing of Baghdad and how they were comparing it to other bombings in different campaigns in history and how that just wasn't fair. And apparently the radio station I was listening to was getting its feed from CNN. And while he's saying this in the background, you can hear the bombing of Baghdad. So much so that a voiceover came over and said, we want to explain to you what is going on right now. (laughs) Anyway, so he's complaining about this. And then like two minutes later, a general gets on and he starts talking about embedded journalists. And I'm like, what in the hell is an embedded journalist? Have you ever heard that term? Uh, Once. I saw it in an editorial cartoon or something of that nature several weeks ago about the same issue. But not before this war. No. I've never heard that term before this war either. But apparently what it is is a decision that since the last Gulf War that I affectionately call Gulf War version 1.0, Since that iteration of the Gulf War uh, was a flop because everybody complained about how little access the media has, they've now compromised by including members of the media with different divisions. So they're going out and they're like part of whichever advancing force they're part of, and they're getting up close and personal with the war. You see all these G.I. Joe portraits where you get to know the soldiers, which are, you know, heartwarming and, and, and I'm sure very comforting in a way to family members. It's so controlled. And then on top of it all, because it's just a little slice of the war that he gets, that's exactly what Rumsfeld was complaining about. He's like, well, you're just getting a little slice of the war. Well, it turns out that they're getting a little slice of the war by design. I mean, he's on the one hand, he's complaining that the war isn't being covered well. And on the other hand, it's not being covered well because the only access they're allowing is this embedded thing. And one is left to wonder why, if Rumsfeld is complaining about the way the game is played, given that he and his cronies make all the rules, what could the purpose have been of his comment? Well, here's an educated guess. He wanted to distract attention from the fact that he and his cronies were the ones making all the rules. He complained about the coverage to make it appear as if the coverage was something outside their control. Yeah, something independent. Never mind that in the next nanosecond, an army general, a U.S. army general, was it uh, army or some other branch of the service? I have no idea. Got I, a, I didn't, I mean, he didn't ad- identify himself other than case, general. A U.S. Was armed on the radio. forces general got up there and stated that journalists were being combined with the military for the purposes of this exercise, quote, exercise, close quote, meaning... Except he didn't state it. Let's make it clear. He didn't state it. He just used the term embedded journalist. It was marked with the term embedded journalist without explanation, in part because this was just business as usual. Therefore, the inconsistency with the previous remarks just went unnoticed. If there were an independent media here, I would think that they would have jumped on that. I mean, there was a question and answer session immediately after that. This was a press conference. And instead of jumping on the discussion, they started asking him about tactics. It's, I don't know, McChesney, Robert McChesney talks about this, about the professionalism of journalism. And he discusses how um, this professionalism is an attempt to be objective. But in essence, it just leaves you reliant upon the so-called experts. And in this case, the so-called experts is the American military. 
and they have an agenda and they are manipulating this. And so instead of being objective, which, you know, whatever that is, it becomes highly biased towards power. Yeah, for some reason, I don't know if this is consistent with McChesney's comments on the subject or not, but for some reason, professionalism became defined in the journalistic context as meaning reprinting press releases from authority figures some time ago. And I was out of the room when that one was put to a vote, rest assured. Not just reprinting press releases, but only asking questions that were acceptable when you do have access. So you have the same person in place. He's approved of as the representative from the news organization. Um, You know, presidential press conferences have become extremely controlled over the years. It used to be that the news organization would send whoever they want and they would just open the door. And as long as you had your credentials, you know, where you've been cleared as a member of a certain organization, you went in. Now they, you went in as a a representative of that organization and the organization had control over who they sent in. Now they look at the specific reporter. And they reject. They tell CNN who they can send. They tell ABC who they, they can being, send. I want to qualify. They being the White House. The White House, yes. So if the White House is not happy with a particular reporter's questions, they can refuse to give the credentials to the reporter the next time, which essentially forces CNN to either fire them or reassign them or whoever. I'm using CNN as an example, but essentially makes the news organization have to Uh, reassign the reporter because he no longer has access and if they're going to have access they have to get the approved person and it also used to be that reporters would yell out questions and would you know sort of be in the face of the president and now it's in an orderly manner in which the president gets to pick and choose hands so if you asked a question the last time that he didn't like he might not pick your raised hand this time and so if you want a story and you want to be the one to ask the question, then you toe the line. And, and it doesn't look like um, censorship, but it is. I mean, it ends up being self-censorship in a way. Because the terms of the discourse are left unmarked. Yeah. The discourse is presented as if it were a contextual, but once one knows the context, one can never be so deceived. I said deceived again. Yes. Suppose for the sake of argument, one wanted to address public policy and current affairs from a viewpoint not consistent with that of, quote, American common sense, close quote, which is to say American enculturation. Uh, Suppose one wanted to get on the radio or television with such a viewpoint on a regular basis. What would one as a practical matter have to do? I would say that step one would be leave the United States. Almost, yeah. I mean, is that... There's not a whole lot of venues left there. I mean, they exist, but there's so much competition for them that once again, you end up having to fulfill somebody's idea of what is correct alternative media and what is not. So even the alternative media, because it's so underfunded and has so few venues in the United States, becomes highly competitive and therefore self-censoring. Moreover, the competition is limited to those who are involved in the media already. New entrants into the less than conformist side of it, into the more than conformist side of it, are not permitted. There are a few people out there who are complaining about what's happening in the United States, a few Americans in any case. There are many people complaining about it, but only a few Americans. But the Americans who are complaining about it openly and being heard are all 75 years of age and up. Oh, you're talking about in in the media. Yeah, I'm talking not just the media, but in the other public venues that still exist, such as they are. Robert Byrd has to be over 100 years old. (laughs) I don't think he's over 100, but I think he might be over 70. Um, Yeah, and Robert Byrd's been a wonderful voice in the midst of this, but one does wonder where the younger voices are. They aren't permitted to enter the game in the first place. There's your answer. Yep. You're listening to First Person Plural, your source for soothing sounds of sociological sagaciousness. The police state? 
is using its phallocentric organ, the corporate media, to control ordinary people like you and me. I think this is interesting, too, because it brings us to what about the people on the streets? There are some huge marches going on, but they're going on in the big cities, at least as far as I can tell from the media coverage up here. And the media coverage of the marches just kill me because they are not... I, you always hear how many people showed up, you hear whether or not there was violence, how many arrests were made, how many police were there, the dispute over the amount of people. But where's the message? It's just labeled anti-war. You know? Oh, the anti-war, or the peace protesters came out. But there's no real discussion about what their message is. And I've read some in the alternative media on the Internet, and the message is far more... Um, intelligent and far more complex than this little sound bite that you get and discussions over whether or not it it how big it was and whether or not it was peaceful enough just serve an idea oh yeah and the other thing is the age thing you would think that no middle-aged people were out there at all yeah and that's absolutely untrue it's a fiction that the media has promulgated for I don't know what reason but I can guess this is far from being a children's movement or an older people's movement and it's also far from being a liberal movement I mean there are quite a few people who are out there in the streets who are not necessarily identified as liberals there are some quote-unquote conservatives who are pretty upset with this. They don't feel like it's the government's position or place to be policing the world, that that's the place of the United Nations. Even if you just talk about the war, it becomes complex, but it also becomes complex because there's a whole lot of people who are out there in the streets who are saying, why do we even have to talk about the war anyway? And there was an article in the San Francisco Chronicle talking about how um, one of the earlier peace marches that were happening before the war began was going through a neighborhood that I gathered, I didn't recognize the name of the neighborhood, but I gathered from the interview, the, the interviews that they did, was a predominantly Afri African-American neighborhood. And they interviewed a woman who said, oh, well, it's good to see black faces in this crowd. And then they interviewed um, another person who said, who speculated that the reason that there were so few African Americans actually going out and protesting, at least in San Francisco, was because there were other issues that were really important to African Americans that were not being addressed at all anymore. Because this administration has used terrorism and has used Iraq to avoid a whole lot of issues. And there are a considerable amount of people on the streets who are there to raise those other issues. So it not only becomes complex because there are a lot of ways to look at the war, but it also becomes complex because there are a lot of other issues on the table that the media is not covering at all. As much as I hate to do it, I can't blame W for this one. This has been a theme that's been recurrent in American politics, or at least to the limits of my memory, which begins in the 1960s. And that is that the discursive function of the U.S. president is to set the topic for public discourse. To wh Whatever the president is talking about is what we're all going to be talking about the next day. And someone who says, excuse me, what about this other topic, is not really going to get a huge groundswell behind him, no matter how pertinent or insightful his selection of topic is. Yeah, but what you can blame W for is the topic that he's chosen. And he chose this American imperialistic tone even before 9-11. I mean, he was backing out of treaties and talking about how America was going to do this, that, or the other thing in the world, in world politics. Bill Maher talked about, uh, right after he was fired for being ironic on television, um, talked about how there was a moment in time that America had 
to immediately after 9-11 in which they could have rose to the occasion. And instead, they rose, they, they mired themselves in revenge talk and so forth. This doesn't surprise me about W, and it doesn't surprise me that much about America either. I grew up like you did, you know, you were talking about since the 1960s. I grew up during the Cold War, and I remember very well the use of war rhetoric in order to keep people under control. It's a long tradition now, several generations long, maybe even longer, in the States to use a state of war to erode the protection of human rights. I know it's beyond belief, isn't it? You think they learn after a while, but the nor the norm there has always been once somebody says there's a war, all recourse, all remedies, all legal standing is forfeit except to corporations. All the sitting president has to do is pump enough war rhetoric into the public discourse, and he is in a unique position to do this, and people will fork over all legal standing, not just civil rights or human rights, but legal standing itself without so much as a word of complaint. I think you're missing an element. What is that? I don't think it's just what they declare, because they tried this in the 80s. Reagan tried the war on drugs. It didn't work. And one of the reasons that I think it didn't work, you know, the way that I think he intended it to work, is because people were not terrified, fearful of drugs. Not really. Everybody made a joke about it, and, um, you know, there were people who took it very seriously. But let's face it, it didn't, it didn't keep you up at night scared to death. Yeah, and the most famous example from the propaganda campaign is the one that's been the most enthusiastically parodied this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs, this is your brain on drugs with some bacon bits and a little cheese that we had left over in the fridge from last night's supper. <laughs> yeah, it just didn't... This is your brain on drugs over easy. Any questions? Yeah, can I get some toast with that? Is it extra? <laughs> exactly. It didn't work. And it didn't work because there needed to be a certain amount of fear. There is fear about communism, and there is fear about terrorism. And uh, that, I think, has made, it, made the job easier for this president. The thing is, if you really, really are afraid of the terrorists, then you would want solutions that would work. And the solutions that are occurring now are not making the world safer. That's the thing that bothers me the most about this. I mean, it isn't people say, oh, well, you know, you're talking about this. And, and well, I imagine nobody's really ever said this to me, but I imagine that the counter argument is, my God, you know, they're out to get us. They hate us. They want to hurt us. Why wouldn't we protect ourselves? I agree. I think that people need to be protective. I'm not a blanket pacifist. I don't believe that war is never justified. I don't believe that violence is never justified. I grew up in rough areas of the world in which if you didn't know how to defend yourself, you could get hurt. Oh, sure, but that's not what this is about. This is about I, certain social classes are at liberty to use violence, certain social classes are not. This is not a cowboy culture we're talking about. It's a plantation culture, and there is a huge difference. That's an interesting, you don't think it's a cowboy culture? No, I think there's a lot of cowboy rhetoric, but I think at bottom there is very rigid social order. The Americans are not anarchists. So they by, are very class conscious. So by plantation you mean feudal? Yes, that's exactly what I mean. That's it's it. all about who you are. They either decide you are worthwhile or not, and once they have decided which group you fall into, everything you do is either rationalized or way or punished. Everything you do becomes one more reason why you are exactly what they said you were at the beginning. And it's all rationalization after the fact. It's classism in the extreme. It is feudalism in the extreme. I think that it belies the whole rhetoric about protection. It belies the whole rhetoric about self-defense. It belies the whole rhetoric about liberation. 
that's what, I mean, if the world needs to be a safer place, which I think it does need to be a safer place, the world is a scary place. But I have to tell you that a lot of the people who are in control of this on both sides scare me. And I think that that probably is why I think the world is is a much more dangerous place than it was two or three years ago. Not just because there are people in the world who want to hurt English-speaking Westerners, but because the English-speaking Westerners are being ruled by people who want to fight back in ways that make it more dangerous. It's a dance that's going on. And I'm not seeing a lot of sanity. I think that's because the English-speaking Westerners, or some of them anyway, have decided that rather than cleaning out the mess they made historically, they decided to heck with it. We're just going to ride the horse until it drops. You say the planet is being depleted? Fine, we'll deplete it faster. You say that people are being oppressed in all parts of the world? Fine, we'll oppress them more. They just don't want to clean up after themselves. They've decided they aren't going to clean up after themselves. So in a way, it's almost pain avoidance. You could say that, or they might really think the situation is hopeless. Or they might simply have decided that, oh, well, do what they did with the budget. Run off the credit card bill and send it to the grandkids. You have been listening to First Person Plural, because how people get along with each other still matters. First Person Plural is a show created for Community Radio by Carl Wilkerson and Dr. Patty Thomas to examine social and organizational issues. Music for First Person Plural is performed, composed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson, except where noted. For more information about First Person Plural, Dr. Patty Thomas, or Carl Wilkerson, Visit our website, www.culturalconstructioncompany.com, or email us at fpp at culturalconstructioncompany.com. 